All right. Well, good afternoon. Good morning. Maybe even good evening, depending where you are in the world. I'm Dan Seawald, and welcome to our eighth edition of The Deliberate Way. Now, we've had a short break for some of the summer festivities and travel, but we're back. And let me tell you, there is no better way to spice up your Tuesday. It is Tuesday, right? Yeah, it's Tuesday. There's no better way to spice up your Tuesday than to be able to talk with Dr. Sarah. Uh, I'm going to tell you all about Sarah. Tara, I'm gonna, Sarah, I'm going to tell you all about yourself in a moment, but I have to give full disclosure here. Sarah and I go way back. Um, it's probably been about 15 years when Sarah did her first foray in corporate America. And as we had a chance to work together, one day we're in the cafeteria, back in the days when people went to the office and we were chit-chatting and I said, oh, what do you have going on later today? And she said to me, well, actually I have a, uh, a talk show that I'm gonna be doing. And I laughed, I said, yeah, no, really. And she said, well, actually I am. I, um, I have something that I'm doing on the BBC. And that's when I scratched my chin and said, this is not your usual corporate innovator, not by a long shot. Um, as I would discover, Sarah and, and folks, is that you are definitely a unique person in many ways. And as it turns out, Sarah is one of the real thought leaders in the space of human relationships, love, and sexology. Yes, I said the three-letter word that nobody likes to say these days, but yes, sex. I guess sexology has more than three letters, but sex does have three letters. Now, we're going to be delving in what may seem like far outside the bounds of corporate innovation, but you're going to find the deliberate practices, habits, and things that Dr. Sarah Nazarzadad does are going to have really interesting implications, not just personally, but also even professionally. So I'm excited and it's a real treat and pleasure to have you here, Sarah. So thank you for joining. Thank you so much for having me. It's going to and be fun. It's, it's already fun. Sarah, now I'm going to tell you a little bit about yourself so folks know about you. Um, you were born in Iran. You were educated in the United Kingdom and you became an American citizen, been working in the U.S. and outside for that matter also ever since. And during that time, you've been called a leading expert in the relational space of intimacy, um, working with couples, corporate media, um, large corporations, uh, the United Nations, which I thought was super interesting, as well as NGOs in this space. And um, amongst other things that people may not know about you, Sarah, um, you are a regular on the BBC World Service, Persian TV on human sexuality and relationships. You've been a cultural advisor, a consultant for governments and NGOs, and people may have caught you before on TV and on the radio on ABC News, BBC, Al Jazeera, CNN, NPR, and uh, maybe a whole bunch of other acronyms as well. So you're pretty, pretty widely distributed and out there. What I thought was super interesting that I didn't know was that you were named as one of the best love doctors by Harper's Bazaar and also an organization called datingadvice.com named you as one of the 10 best sex and dating experts. And there's been so many other impressive awards, even particularly around innovation, which I thought was, was super interesting. The BBC gave you an innovation award, which was really exciting. Um, I will mention one other thing without going too deep on this, is that you have a forthcoming book about the notion of love. It has not come out yet, but it's pending. And uh, I guess your publishers would probably have you drawn and quartered if I talked any more about it. But uh, that's coming in the fall. Maybe tell me a little bit more about it without revealing too much. Uh, sure. So um, if I may say good morning, good evening, good day and night to everybody who's listening. Um, yes, it's a book on love, um, the accumulation all of all of my work and research in the past two decades. Uh, so I'm very excited and hopefully there will be tons of innovation in it. So it's not what you think. 
<laughs> so I encourage people to get out and kind of as soon as the pre-orders, pre-orders should be ready sometime later this year. And we are hoping for the release by the beginning of next year. Very exciting. Now, my interest is so peaked. We're going to have to peel some things out of you today, but not too much, just enough to maybe whet our appetites. Um, Sarah, now you may be a first time viewer of The Deliberate Way. There are probably others who've seen it before. For those who are kind of the uh, the neophytes, if you will, a couple of words. The Deliberate Way is a way for us to meet and listen to experts like you um, and understand the deliberate way that people approach their craft. Whether you're a scientist, an athlete, an artist, an advocate, a sexologist, uh, by getting to know you better, to know about your craft and your practices, we're able to discover a few practices, habits, tips that really can apply to our own lives. Because we find, I find, that the most successful people, the most innovative people are inherently deliberate in the way they do things. So I'm excited to delve deeper. And without any further ado, let me ask you the kind of first most obvious question. What do you do during the day? What, what is a sexologist? What, tell me a little bit more about you and what you do in your craft. That's a great question. And I have to say, depending on the day and which one of my hats I'm wearing, it could vary. But hmm. whatever I do has to do something with the way that people relate to one another and relationships, whether I'm doing research, facilitating meetings or um, sitting with clients writing, um, anything that I do has to do something with relating. Mm, interesting. Very, very mysterious. Tell me a little bit more, because when I hear sexologist, intimacy, I figure it's kind of the, the very kind of brass tacks of, of the way people relate or engage. But it sounds like it's more than that. It, it goes much yeah. more beyond that. Tell, tell me a little bit more. Well, you know, when we talk about the relating, if I may go back a little bit, Please. because when I was growing up in Iran, um, it was post-revolution. So post-revolution, you had to learn who you are, who the other person is, because it could be dangerous to share anything from your family to um, you had to preserve parts of you for different social circles or you know political circles just to keep yourself and, you know, your loved ones faith, um, safe. So through that land of paradox that, you know, who is this, who is that, I started to learn about the concept of the other. Who is the other? Who is one mm. of us? Who is the other? So that was the first thing when we're talking about relating, right? And then little by little, uh, as you're talking about deliberation, you know, the way that you do one thing is the way that you do everything. That's what I came to realize. Hmm. I went to sexology. Well, first, actually, before sexology, I went to linguistics. And if I wasn't a doctor in social psychology, I wouldn't, I would be a linguist for sure. Because I was always interested to see where the languages lead us culturally and socially. And where um, we lead the language. Mm -hmm. And that came to help me a lot during our work, um, you know, with the BBC, for example, I realized that um, so there are certain languages that depending on the needs, language has to um, correspond to the needs of a society, right? Let's say, for example, you are speaking with a group of Eskimos. They have variety of words for snow. Mm -hmm. Somebody who grew up in a desert, they didn't really need that. They might have a lot of terminology around the word sand, different types mm -hmm. of sand, right? So these are the things that always fascinated me. Fast forward, thinking about sex, and I'm hosting this show for the BBC, and I'm realizing that to empower people around sex, relationships, anything, we need to give them words so that when we are talking about pleasure, we are talking about orgasm, you know, whatnot, it's not something that the foreigners do. So it was really important to have a Farsi term to, or do term. So terminology that people could actually relate to and say, actually, orgasm is not only for Western liberated people, hmm. but we have it too. Interesting. So language it, it, really weaves in into everything. I, I, wanna, I wanna rewind a little bit too, if you don't mind. This is very, very interesting. So going back to your kind of your origin story, 
I, as you, we talked about beforehand, I love origin stories of how did people arrive at where they are today. You already mentioned that you had a propensity for linguistics and that kind of was kind of led you there, but you also are an immigrant. You had moved from Iran to the UK, to the US. Generally, I found that most people's kind of, kind of migrations have a big impact on the way they do things, the way they, they see things. Tell me a little bit about the experience of being in Iran, which has been sort of noted as the kind of the arch enemy of the United States. I know that's not necessarily true, but um, it's often sort of posited that way politically to being here in the U.S. How has that shaped the work that you do and the choices that you've made? I'd love to hear more about that. Well, you see, that's interesting. And I'm glad that you asked that question, because if you think about the United States and Iran at the political level, that's exactly what you're talking about. So they really, you know, like at least on the surface, they're like this with each other. But when you talk about humanity, people, look, um, with the women life freedom movement that we just had, you know, really not we, I shouldn't really include myself because they were brave mostly younger generation of Iranians that led that movement, right? I don't know if you were uh, following up on social media. There were so many people who had nothing to do by blood, by ethnicity, by lineage to Iran from this country and any other country in the world that they were avid supporters. So when it comes to the humanity, when it comes to our needs for agency, for freedom, for liberation, for truth, for moral values, I think we come together more than we know. Mm. So on that note, I would say, if I tap into the other, I could really keep myself distance. If I tap into the other, but also who shares my values, my fears, my deepest human, ne um, deepest human needs, then the unity will be um, more powerful. There's very, very the distances. Tell, tell me a little bit more, just uh, how did you you come from Iran all the way to the U.S. And, and end up in this particular field? Tell me a little bit more about that. Well, when I was in Iran, I started, I um, did my linguistic degree in Iran. So at the time, I was the representative of the university. And I was always like that. I was always the representative of the class since I was, I remember when I was six, I would, you know, do the morning you know, announcements of the school. And I was always like that. And it goes back to my parents that they always said that we have more responsibilities beyond ourselves, be there for the other. And I'm so grateful because, you know, they actually raised us um, not thinking only about ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I know many people, many of your listeners do that as well. So fast forwarding from that, I realized that there are so many different things that people don't talk about. Like for example, um, talking about Iran, schools are separate. We don't have co-ed schools up to 12th grade, like nowhere. Kindergartens are separate now. So even at the kindergarten level, it's separate. So if I grew up in a family that I don't really have any cousins or any brothers or, you know, um, any male figure, I really don't know much about men. I don't know mm -hmm. how to interact with them. I'm taught to be scared of them. You know, this is just um, like when I was growing up, it's very different now, obviously, within the social system that we can talk about later. And um, so one thing that I wanted to do at the time was I was at the age that I wanted to start dating. I wanted to start to see, okay, who is out there? Is there somebody that I'm going to meet and maybe marry, maybe start my family? And then I was thinking to myself, where am I supposed to see this person? Only at the parties, like underground parties, only at my music class, only at, which happened actually, I met my husband through music. So, so there was a live TV show and I volunteered to be on that live TV show. And there were the, um, all the heads of the universities, big universities in Iran. So my topic of conversation was I wanted to advocate for co-ed. I said, look, we are maturing. COVID was not typical in Iran. Just, just putting that out there, that was not, not permitted. No. Well, there were universities, like, for example, medical school, very few universities that had COVID classes, but women sitting here, men sitting here. So, like, still, no mingling, no public mingling as such. 
But my question to the head of the university in that live TV was, you say, keep away. Okay, we do that. And then you say, but meet somebody and then, you know, get to know them and make a very successful couple them and marry them for the rest of your life. And, you know, um, Iran, at least by the governmental, you know, jurisdictions is a Muslim country. So in Islam, marriage is half of your religion. So if we are supposed to keep all, you know, all of this pressure and how am I supposed to not know a man, how to treat them, how to be there, not know, not knowing anything about myself at the presence of another person, you know, an opposite uh, person, opposite sex person. And all of a sudden, I'm going to just enter the marriage and live happily ever after. How's that going to happen? So I'll how, talk does that, how did that work out for the most part in Iran? Was, was it greater tension in marriages or greater failure rates? Eh, not really, not no. really. But the differences are, they have their own challenges. You know, human relationships are, you know, in different ways. But I have to say that from the experiences I have, you know, consulting with people, especially on the show, the level of questions are more basic than you get here. So like, you know, like how to relate to the other person, it starts with the anatomy, how to, so, you know, seeing this person as a very different entity than yourself, you know? So the, the, these are the things that come up that um, mm -hmm. are a little bit more different. Tell me about, so the, Let's be, move a little forward from there. The the talk show that you you were on or were responsible for in the BBC, um, where did it go to? Who did it reach? What was the focus of it? Um, tell tell us a little bit more about that because it sounds like that was very important and and had a lot of impact on on many people. But maybe elaborate a little bit more about that if you would. Sure. You know, also linking it to the topic of conversation he, here to be deliberate and to be innovative, right? Mm -hmm. One of the things that I wanted to do was to reach people where they were. And, you know, mm -hmm. I did a PhD on that, you know? So in my PhD, I actually had a hard to reach group to study and I put it in quotation mark. And it was very funny because the first meeting I had, they thought it's my language barrier that I put it in quotation. I said, no, 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 that's very deliberate because depending on who you call hard to reach, maybe we are actually alienating them further. Hmm. So nobody's hard to reach if you reach them. Have that in the back of your mind. Mm -hmm. so I went to the BBC editor and I said, look, um, I want to meet people beyond filters, beyond what is allowed or what is not. I want to produce an evidence informed platform for people around sexuality and relationships. And this was the first, obviously, and it was pretty interesting to kind of put forward. Um, I wanted to meet people where they were. Now, I'll tell you how it worked. I'm so grateful to the BBC that gave me that platform, really, truly. First, we started with radio program. Why? Because you could actually have your radio sneak out somewhere and listen every Wednesday night, listen to it. And the letters that we got and phone calls, and um, it's amazing, amazing, really. So, and then after that, we moved to online and TV. Um, so nobody could filter us. People mm -hmm. get the information. Um, so my um, thing was not just, oh, well, put a program together about sexuality. My question, again, deliberation and innovation goes back to the questions you ask, right? How do I reach these people? They're somewhere. So millions of people, to answer your question, millions of people, obviously, whoever that is spoke for see anywhere in the world, I still, to this day, like I go to somewhere I walk in and they recognize my voice or they recognize, it's so interesting how many people even are telling me that every Wednesday night we would gather with friends and listen wow. to the program. And then after that, we have this conversation and it warms my heart because that was the purpose to break that taboo, you know? And tell, tell me about the, what type of topics would come up and, and I guess sort of adjacent to that, I'll, I'll load this with one other question. I, I would assume that that relationships and the ideas of love are very different across different regions and countries and cultures. Did you find that having um, having worked across different cultures and and what type of impact did your work 
have on those people that you were reaching? Um, so two kind of kind of uh, connected questions, but I'd love to hear about both of those. So as you know, I work across countries and what it means is that I don't just go to deliver a training or something. Wherever that I go in the world, so far, I think it's about 40 something countries. So when I go, if I speak the language, I deliver it in that specific language because I think, you know, it empowers the people. And if I don't speak the language, I work with the interpreter to kind of phone in into the tailor-made language for that group. And I ask them to see the actual people. So that is not just me and the professionals in the room, just uh -huh. the, right? So people come and then, you know, I conduct a client session and then, you know, people observe, you know, this sort of work. Some other work that I, I do, I go to communities and talk to them. A lot of the, depending on where I am, sometimes the, because of my background, people relate better. And, and I have to ask them, which part of me you're relating to? Is this a woman from Iran that is going to agree with you being, for example, you know, the ideas that people have of a woman from Iran? They never in their wildest dream thought that a woman from Iran could teach, you know, like sexology, for example. Um, so they want to demystify, they want me to normalize it for them that, you know, people in the most advanced and, you know, progressive countries, like, for example, Sweden, do it the same way that we do. So a part of it is destigmatization and normalization for people. Another part of it is to be the ambassador, because I always feel like I'm so privileged to go around the world to learn the lessons and then come and say, well, have you thought about it? I thought that, you know, for example, in Afghanistan, they do it this way. Do you want to give it a try? Mm. Or I go and say, in Egypt, they do it this way. In Iceland, they do it this way. So, oh, that's really interesting. So let's give it a try here. So kind of bridging the gaps between cultures and bringing the collective wisdom to help people where they feel stuck. So you that would be the first thing. What, and and I, I have to ask one quick follow-up is uh, when you think about people who are stuck or cultures that maybe um, are, are less or more progressive, what do you see as some of those characteristics of those that are more progressive versus those that are stuck, if you will? Um, what, what have you observed, given that you've been across the world talking with, with people about their relationships? For me, the best way to answer that is the most progressive people, and I'm not talking about the wealthiest countries or whatnot, right? Mm -hmm. But most progressive individuals that I meet are the ones who have healthy boundaries, healthy and firm boundaries. And they're not in a place who are stuck and they have to create borders around themselves. So for me, that's an immediate observation that if a person is um, open enough to let the information in and they are analytical enough, they have the tools, they have the permission and the tools to be analytical about the information they receive and put it to use the way that they want mm -hmm. uh, based on whatever context that they live in. So for me, the difference is between having healthy and firm boundaries versus borders. Do you find that the, the, the idea, the word love is defined differently by people? um culturally and even kind of over time they you know there's this very when i when people say love they you assume there's a singular definition it's very kind of monolithic um i mean based on our conversations i'm going to assume you don't believe that uh what have you seen like how do people think about that word that notion differently across different places and even different stages of their relationships for that matter I'm trying to think how to summarize three chapters of my book. Here. <laughs> so um, nobody said it would be easy. Yeah, give that in a thirty-second thumbnail, if you would. I'm sorry. No, give us in a thirty-second. Uh, oh yeah, absolutely. So going back to the languages, you know, everything starts yeah. there. Like how we experience and how we express that experience, right? Um, 
Yeah, there are differences. Like for people who speak different languages, they know exactly what I'm talking about. Like, because in English we say love, being in love, you know, falling in love. So the language around love is different. But if you go to at least the languages that I am familiar with, let's say Farsi, for example, or Arabic or Kurdish, or there are so many nuances in the way that you talk about love. The, mm. the manic love, the uh, familial love, you know, love for a mother and a father could be different. Love for the in-law and your own family could be different. There are um, individual terms separate, kind of your Eskimo example that there's many different words, but they have specific words. In English, we have sort of a word with context around it. But exactly. It, and what love does that say about Americans or, or kind of Anglo-Saxon people? Or does it say anything? I, I don't know. I'm well, to be honest, what I find fascinating is that in American culture, as a low context country, and let me elaborate on that. So we have, by large, if we have two spectrums around languages, right? One, uh, one side is low context, which is America is a very good example of low context. Mm, and on the other side of it, high context, countries who are older, um, they had more time to evolve around language. They are more homogenous as a society. Mm. They are more high context. So if I look at you, for example, I don't need to say much. I just look at you and you read between lines, right? The micro expressions are more important. You read the room a lot better, right? But in the low context countries, which are non-homogenous as much and a land of immigrant as we are in America, mm -hmm. yeah. that's what makes it great, right? So we come together and we try to have words for everything because I don't wanna leave room for assumption or confusion, right? So now it's funny because in the high context countries, majority of them, we have a lot of words to describe things like love, like honesty, like decency, these sort of things that have to do with essence of human connection. We have a lot of words to describe different nuances in them. In the low context countries, we come up with a lot of words to describe one word. So mm -hmm. for love, we talk about it and then we talk about it some more and then we talk about it some more. <laughs> so, but then we're still talking about the same thing, you know? Very so, interesting. I hadn't thought I hadn't thought that deeply about it. But then again, I haven't written three chapters on it either. So that's <laughs> a very and I want to just I want to come back to one other thing, which is about time. Um that a lot of people, when we talk about love, that this idea that it's the same when you meet someone as, you know, as the relationship carries on the ebbs and flows, um, or maybe there's an expectation that, you know, love is just this thing. Um, does it change over time? And is that sort of uh, kind of a uh, an expectation that it should change? So the way that we view love at the beginning of relationship is only one aspect of love, hmm. and that is the problem. So tell me more. Yeah. So instead of having that splash of orange color that, oh, my God, I can't get my hands off of you. Right. Mm -hmm. Over a period of time, this has to turn into a rainbow more of different layers, more str like a stronger, better foundation. And many people do that. 50% of the society who don't end up with miserable marriages, or I'm just exaggerating of the number because there's no like kind of statistics, but uh, it's not like everybody is miserable. Many people like yourself have been married for such a long time and me too, you know? And um, so what was different that we still sit here, touch wood, find ourselves, you know, in a situation that what did we do? So that's what I'm interested in. When you talk about that love at the beginning and, you know, yes, it has to be dynamic. It has to change, uh, but for better, for deeper, for mm -hmm. more feeling sense of being rather than, oh yeah, you know what? Honeymoon phase is over. Ah, oh, remember those days? You know, I, I, I wish yeah. somebody would give us a, a little bit of a chart, be an analytical person to say, here are the many stages that your relationship will evolve through. Or maybe it exists. Is It would be great if there was a tool so you could anticipate or plan for that. 
or maybe that's a little too analytical. That's for- why I wrote the book. Ah, all right. Well, now we're getting somewhere. Well, that book's <laughs> got to come out soon, Sarah. We we need help. Um, I want to just note for our, our listeners that you two have an opportunity to ask questions. Please feel free to post questions, comments in LinkedIn Live. Um, we'll moderate those, bring those in in just a handful of minutes. I'm going to pause so you have a chance to have your say. I will also note that after we field your questions, we are going to have a short segment called Truth or Fiction. Okay. And yes, Sarah, you're going to be in the hot seat where I'm going to read off some statements and ask you whether it's a truth or a fiction. So we'll get a little bit more deep into this topic about sex and relationships and love. Um, I do have a couple more quick questions for you, and then we'll ask for any questions from our listeners as well. One question that I had, um, this podcast, this program is called The Deliberate Way, as you know. And I'm always eager to hear about some of the practices and techniques that you may use in whatever your craft may be. But in your craft particularly, you work with people. You work with people in their relationships. Maybe they're struggling in their relationships. Um, Being a great listener and being able to help people definitely requires really specific practices, I would think. What are some of the deliberate things that you do Um, that you can share that you think may have application to others or beyond just um, kind of relationships? Uh, What are some of the things that you are your go-tos? You know, many people say that you need to be curious, listen with curiosity. And to be honest, I left that behind a long time ago because mm-hmm. what I'm noticing is that curiosity is amazing, but it has a hint of ignorance. And I'm not sure if we can afford that in this day and age. Hmm. I don't know the intention behind curiosity, to be perfectly honest. That's that's just where I'm operating from. Mm-hmm. So if I'm sitting here and out of my own curiosity, not knowing, uh, how many kids do you have? What are you doing? What is this? What is that? Without an intention and interest into the mm-hmm. other person, I find that to be a little bit of superficial for my taste. So questions without any obvious kind of roadmap or intention behind it. Is that without the actual genuine interest in the person? If I'm meeting you and I first have to find that interest in me for you, hmm. then my questions are informed. They are not just based on my curiosity and ignorance. That is one thing that I always think about. And, you know, many of the places that hire me, I actually go unprepared because they just want me for my questions. And one of the ways that I, I, uh, um, at first I couldn't really explain when I was going to train, I came up to this understanding that how can I train people in this? And then I realized that, look, you know, put the ignorance hat down, find that interest in that person, in the scenario, in whatever that you're doing, then your questions are so guided by your informed interests, so to speak. And I, then- and How do you set that? How do you find, how do you kind of get at setting that intention right away of having that, that focus? It, it can be tricky. It can take a lot of time to, to find that without asking some of those ignorant or quote unquote, overly curious or misguided questions. How, what, are, what are some of the things you do? to be able to get there faster. Why? Right. Well, they're not necessarily misguided, if I may. They're just not as informed, right? So for me, first connect with the person in front of you. There's a whole person. So I will suspend my agenda and I will go with intention. That's very important. Many of mm. us get into the human relationship or a job or a whatever that we do with agenda. I'm going to do this. This is going to happen, you know, like uh, that. But for me, the intention matters a lot. And uh, I learned that through the facilitation of like high level UN meetings. I might have an agenda, you know, I might have a roadmap, but I can't really hold down rigidly to that. Uh, Like our conversation today, we had top lines. We're going to talk about this and that. But I honestly don't know what even came out because, you know, we were so engaged in this conversation and uh, the topics, whatever that we talk about, right? And um, and I guess this is up to your listeners to say whether they found it worth their time or not. But yeah, 
But you know, this, this is what I'm talking about that, you know, so let go of the agenda, operate with intention and whatever that comes treat with respect and compassion. So mm. these are the four pillars that I operate with when I want to be deliberate about anything in life. So the four, give me the four pillars again. What Genuine are interest. Pillars? Yeah. Which leads the informed question and informed engagement with the mm -hmm. person or whatever scenario that I'm in. And then the other one is operate with respect and compassion. And all of these requires mm -hmm. tremendous courage. So you need to let go of that insecure ego, you know, beyond that making myself presentable today, you know, by look, I feel like, you know, coming to these, I am hoping to worth the while of the listeners. Yeah. I'm not okay. After that, you just let go. You just let go and sit here, just be in the moment and feel like, okay, so what is it that I know I had the privilege to have access to that they didn't? Let me share. So, you know, it taps into that kind of generous nature that every single person in this whole world has instead of the insecurity that how do I come across, you know? Yeah. And I'll, so there, there, and I'll let you know, there are, you're triggering a lot of great questions from the group, but I'll, I'm going to share some of those questions in a moment. I want to ask you one more thing or comment sort of, and ask a question. Um, you mentioned about the United Nations and, uh, and working in a capacity where it is, the, you know, relationships really matter. Um, I'll, I'll put a hypothetical out to you. Might the, the type of work that you do or kind of relationship work, might it have an impact in places where there's tremendous um, conflict and, um, and, and adversity? So places like Russia and Ukraine, um, right now in you know, the United States, a lot of people would argue there's a very heavy adversarial kind of polarity of the you know, red state, blue state, the us and the them. Is it relevant? Like we're talking about love and intimacy, but ultimately, as you said right at the beginning, it's about relationships. Mm -hmm. Would, might this have an impact or is that a little too um, Pollyannish? Is a little bit of a reach? It does. That's why my motto is creating world peace, one relationship at a time. Look, Dan. Um, I like that. I could be sitting in front of a person who hates the gut of an Iranian, you know? Mm -hmm. And if I keep to my corner with my borders and you keep to your corner, you know, with the borders, um, what comes out of this? So, but if we start relating, there are so many examples of amazing people, Jamshid Kharshadari, Kirk Schneider, so many amazing thinkers and writers in this area that um, they all talk about, even like Brenna Brown has a wonderful, um, mm -hmm. I remember she has so many books. So uh, that uh, if I remember it uh, correctly, it's in Dare to Lead. Um, so, you know, so everybody is talking about know the other and then see, find the common spaces, then proceed with that. Like on that note, it might be a little bit irrelevant, but maybe relevant. I okay. hope it's relevant for some people. When you talk about like this, you know, from bedroom to the kitchen, to the boardroom, to the UN meeting, to the conflict zones, it's all about how you enter the scenario, really suspend your judgments, but not to the point that you're sucked into the situation, because that's another issue we have. We try to understand each other. Let's put that to rest. Sometimes we don't understand each other, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that from not understanding each other, we're going to just kill each other. It, it, I mean, it sounds, this is very naive, but if I am working in an organization on a team, managing a team, and there's conflict, um, these same practices that you're using, that you're writing about, um, very well could have real application towards yes. kind of mending fences, fixing those relationships that get in the way of companies being successful, teams thriving. Um, is, I assume that's not an overreach either, just based on what you're saying. Absolutely not. We are all human. There's a human involved. There's a human nature involved and we are all the same. So when we want to do innovation, I don't know how much you remember of those workshops that we did at Pfizer. Very well. Going back to the basic, right? It's all about who said that. These people are evil. Who said that? We need to do this. Who said that? 
Mm -hmm. you know so just questioning the status quo like in the book I bring so many examples that my editor was actually laughing oh my god I didn't know that so it's like yeah so we go with so many assumptions that who really said that let's question let's just not question for conflict you know production but let's question maybe there's a new way of thinking maybe I like I like your your term of productive questioning not asking questions with a false an insincere curiosity but productive questions to really understand um that can apply to any field in anywhere i love that you're you're pulling that out i didn't expect us to go there but i'm I'm glad we did i'm gonna pause for a moment because i'm gonna turn some of the questions over to um to our listeners so The first one that came up is how applicable do you feel the five love languages are to a healthy relationship? Are there other books that you'd recommend? So first, are you familiar with the five love languages? Absolutely. Um, Okay. I think it's fantastic. And I'm actually grateful to Dr. Chapman uh, who wrote the book because, you know, as humans, it's so confusing, the whole thing about relationship, conflict resolution, that there are a bazillion books, right? Bazillion podcasts and everything. And each of them tackle it from different perspective. What Five Languages of Love did was, in my humble opinion, I feel like it brought it together, gave it um, the way that the brain, human brain works. Hey, people, don't get confused. Within these, there are nuances, obviously, right? But having a label, having like a way to start the conversation, in that regard, I love that book and the whole, I think there's even a free quiz that people can take, which is really great, right? Just to get this conversation going. So that's one. Regarding further recommendations, there are certain areas that I think everybody needs to know about themselves. And it's not necessarily the book, which I can also recommend, but you can go even go online, just search for, you know, attachment style and the impact on uh, close close relationships, right? Know how you relate to other people. That's your attachment style. You need to know that by now, right? So that's that. And you are not stuck with it, by the way, based on new research, new work in the past 15 years, we know that you can move. If you find yourself in a category that you don't quite find healthy for a relationship. The second thing that you need to know about yourself is your cognitive distortion. Mm. Again, search cognitive distortions and then read about them because cognitive distortions are the way that we process and internalize and make meaning of any information that comes to us. So that's good for you to know. So these are the two things that I want you to start with. Our lovely person who asked great great recommendations um there was a a follow-on that somebody messaged me about um do you recall a book called the rules it was written in the 1990s um and the notion was is that people should follow a very sort of like pre-scripted set of rules such as don't call the guy or the girl after the first date wait multiple days um they codify this and almost created like a, a sheet or a guideline of do these things, don't do them, very prescripted. I'm judging by your body language that you're not a, a big fan or advocate of this sort of um, overly codified advice. That's written not being genuine all over it. And tr- tell me more. What, what do you mean by that? So, you know, okay. So let's take it 50-50, not to be too harsh. I see the product of those rules, right? If you tell me that, Sarah, don't smile when you go on a date, you know me for 15 years. I'm known for my smile. I mean, am I going to go on a date? And I'm like, is that genuine? And then what if I pass that level? Then are, is the book there to tell me what to do? So now I got the person what do I do? That's perpetuation of the idea of crossing the bridge and getting married and the Cinderella thingy. What do you do now? Yeah. Then what, right? All right. Stuck with that fake person that you didn't. Yeah. And that, and somebody asked a follow-on question here, which is not quite the same, but builds on this. Are there goals or what are the goals of the first couple of dates? Are there goals for the first date versus second versus third? Um, your, Your thoughts about that? And it's not quite the same as the prior question. I like that question. 
Um, lovely person who asked that. Do you remember how I talked about genuine interest? Yes. Have a genuine interest and respect for yourself. Know yourself. Like literally don't be hungry, angry, tired, bored, lonely, feeling miserable when you go on the first date. That's important mm. because you know, this is no difference. Yeah. You were going to say something. No, no. I'm listening with curiosity, sincere curiosity. Sincere don't curiosity. Be, I love this point, but don't go in tired or hungry. I could see how that could affect your disposition, your mood. Exactly. Because you are kind of half animal, half person. I mean, you know, you can't really show up well. The other thing is when you are going like su supermarket shopping, if you're extremely hungry, you see how many rubbish you buy. Like we all do that. This is just human psyche, right? Or when you arrive at the restaurant, you order this much and you, you're done after this much. The same thing with dating, right? Mm -hmm. So that is very important for the first, second or whatever date. The other thing is I tell people going back, also linking it to that book rule thingy, uh -huh. you know? So really think about it this way, that if you um, go on a date, try to impress the person, try to get some facts out of them. How nervous would you be? It's an agenda. So, you know, that's one. And then you lead with curiosity. I would love for you to lead with genuine interest. This is a first person. I'm going to have dinner with them. I'm going to have coffee with them. It's a human being. We don't get these moments back. Let's just go get to know each other. And do I like this person? Do I not like this person? Just lead with like. Do you like them? Right? So can I, I have to just, so what, one probing question for you. And, uh, and then we'll go to truth or fiction. But um, some people have described that relationships and dating is a lot like, um, you know, playing a competitive game that you should think about it as like a competition. Um, there's winners and there's losers, there's rules and there's things to be followed. Um, when, when people say it's like a game and you need to follow it, like almost like a strategy, how do you react? And do people bring that up to you? Is that, do people take that sort of like competitive mindset towards relationships and dating from your, from your experience? I think there's enough for all of us in this world, just based on my spiritual belief, I don't believe that you're competing with anyone. And if you mm. are of that camp, you're going to have your trophy and you're going to live a miserable life, like the social media life that your pictures look amazing and you spend God knows how much to keep the thing together. So that's mm. that. I really have a strong opinions about that competition. However, I agree with the strategy. A strategy, I know that it's kind of a convoluted word, but again, going back to, you know, the time that we shared together in corporate, without the strategy of life, without the strategy, the vision for, for your life, you can't really start dating. You need to know where you want to end up or you get sucked in to other person. And then after a period of time, you resent them because they dictate what I do. They control me. No, actually, sorry, you didn't have anything. So that's why you got sucked. The only thing that I want to say here, Dan, mm -hmm. linking everything together, you can trust your gut. Your gut has a brain. We can have another conversation around that. By now, I think many people read the about it. connections, yeah. Exactly. Right? So you will know. But when to trust your gut is you have a polished gut. You cannot have a traumatized, bruised, or scarred gut and then say, well, my gut says this person is wrong or this person is right, because then you're actually misled by your own thing, you know, by your own needs, a mm. crave to heal rather than really have a, a create a sophisticated human relationship with another person. And there was a, I'll, I'll just squeeze one more question in here because I think it's a very, it's a very intriguing one. Your thoughts about online dating apps versus meeting people in person. Um, the landscape has wildly changed. From, I, at least I would say it's wildly changed since I first met my wife in the in the 1990s. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's a different landscape in general. What are your thoughts about online dating versus the kind of the old fashioned way, if you will? I like online dating because it gives you an opportunity a pool of people so we don't really stay only with proximity and at the mercy of other people to set us up or you know what not and some people are shyer so you know it's not like you know everybody's extrovert and oh hi you know I'm open to meet people 
However, my only advice here, just based on pure experience with, you know, couples and dating, uh, make it in person as soon as possible. Mm, interesting. So use that as a mechanism or as a tool, very deliberate way to meet people, but don't rely on it as a crutch to kind of become the relationship in and of itself. Yeah, love that. That, that, that is a great, that's a great piece of advice. Um, all right, we have 10 minutes remaining. I, the time's been flying by, but I couldn't let the 10 minutes go by without playing one of my favorite games, truth or fiction. What I'm going to do is, Sarah, I'm going to read off a statement. You're going to have the minuscule amount of about 30 seconds to be able to say truth or fiction in a quick elaboration of why you think it's a truth or you think it's a fiction. You ready? Yep. All right. First one, successful relationships demand that there's sexual chemistry between partners. Truth or fiction? Fiction based on research. Mm. Tell me real quick. It's not enough. <laughs> it's not enough. It's, it's good to have it, but it's not enough. It's not enough. All right. That was a good start. And that was quick. I'm going to flip it over to one which has been talked about a lot in the press lately. Americans are having less sex now than ever before. Truth or fiction? Yes, my friend actually did the research on that. So yes. Is it is it something to be worried about? No, no. I think, you know, we overemphasized sexual activity by quantity and quality for the longest time. I think the pendulum is going here and hopefully... Um, if you actually go through the research, you will see that there's nothing to worry about. And I hope it's normalizing for people who think everybody else is getting it but me. <laughs> that's that's good. I think there are people who say that. Uh, I've heard it quite a few times. Um, third one, women want relationship sex. Men, they want casual trysts. Absolutely yeah. fiction. Fiction, really? All right, tell me, all right, elaborate a little bit more. I would, I would say, say both true. want both. They want both. Both want both, yes. Huh. But, you know, we can elaborate on that in the sense that by anatomy, women could be considered as hosts and men could be considered as guests, just for pure anatomy, right? Mm -hmm. If it's a heteronormative, by the way, we are talking all heteronormative here, like, you know, like a, you know, like a heterosexual and right. kind of these sort of relationships. Um, on that note, Women want to be um, in, want to be respected. Women want to be appreciated for the host that they are, and women want to be not just bam bam thank you ma'am as we said like thirty years ago, you know. So we re the, they really would like to have that emotional connection, maybe more than men, but it doesn't make that statement true because there are a lot of men who are really suffering because of that, you know, fiction point that you just shared, that, you know, um, this old saying that, oh, men are pig, they're thinking about sex all the time. The brain of the woman is shoes and bags and everything and sex is this much. And the brain of a man is all sex. And this piece is about, you know, whatever. That That's not true. That's not true. All at right. all. Well, well, then let's see where we go with this next one. On average, men think about sex every seven seconds. Truth or fiction? It really depends what is the source here, because huh. this came out long time ago. True. Yeah. Really, you know, like look through the research. And um, I honestly don't think there's an evidence behind it. So I don't have a comment. Is this an urban myth or it could be I, an urban myth? Yes. Yeah. I've heard it perpetuated so often that I've accepted it as a fact. But um, I like the fact that you haven't seen anything in your research that would suggest that that is a fact. Not my research or any research that is actually solid based on fMRI, based on like a continuous monitoring of the brain. Yeah, no. All right. All right. Well, that we'll put that one to rest. Um, one that's a little bit different. Arranged marriages are less successful than self-chosen or directed marriages depending on how you define success. If you are going by statistics of divorce, arranged marriages have less number of divorces. But if you go to subjective reporting of the satisfaction, 
the subjective reporting in majority of arranged marriages is also higher than the you know so so called self arranged or you know love uh, love arranged but in general um it's in the middle i can't really comment one statistically i can say that the arranged marriages have better success but depending on how you define success but that may also be a product of people avoiding divorce because of other social factors and stigmas yeah. perhaps around it yeah That's right. so not, not a not a clear cut and dry truth or fiction no, and also they are constitutionally and socially bound. And social media actually does that for the couples now because, you know, they post these videos and images that they're on date nights and, you know, whatnot. And when I facilitate uncoupling for people, we have to go through their social media and actually erase all of those and, you know, create a story that it's it's a whole thing. So the community that kept the couple together now is the social media. Wow. All right. Well, that's... That is a tough one, although I guess the delete button is pretty accessible. All right, next one I've got. This is one I've heard quite a bit. Chocolate and oysters are natural aphrodisiacs. There are Super certain, fiction. well, again, in the middle, yes. I, I can say aphrodisiac because, you know, they they have oyster has zinc. And so there are ingredients in each that could uh, produce energy and a sense of positivism uh, and um you know and and if they break down in the body they could produce that kind of you know sense of desire and passion and uh, but it's not like you know if you have a mountain of oyster then you're really horny or you know, all over the place no so i shouldn't try to apply uh, oysters on on my wife in anytime soon to to trick her into you can give it a try if she's not allergic <laughs> well it can't hurt all right Last couple I've got for you. Um, this idea of having a child will strengthen your relationship or marriage. Is that a truth or a fiction? Both. Both. All right. Tell me more. Again, depending on the foundation of your marriage, if you are very much babes in the wood and you are just very much into each other, um, you know, like you are under the perception that you found your person, then any third person is going to be very annoying and is going to, you know, make you fall apart or, you know, the demand of the um, current parenthood is also a lot um, that, you know, we have to be everything to each other and everything to our kids. Um, so that piece of it is a lot of people choose not to have kids because they're so scared on wow. the other side of it, there are expectations around having kids in certain families. And sometimes when you have kids, um, you see different aspects of your, uh, mate of your person that, um, it's actually very endearing and it deepens your love for them. Different types of love enter the family. So I would say both. All right. It's a, not as cut and dry. I have one more for you. Um, one that I've heard from, from multiple people before. When, when the sex is bad or non-existent, that means your relationship is in deep trouble. Is that a truth or is that a fiction? I'm afraid most of the times it's true because we also have research around it. In the U.S., we have a representative research to show that when people, when sex is working is one of those, may, depending on the meaning people attach to it, right? When it's working, so to speak, let's put it in the, you know, kind of air quote. Um, right. Nobody even pays attention. They're not gonna sit, you know, and say that, oh, our sex is so good and the relationship, you know, maybe at the beginning. But when it's not, when the connection is not there, se more than 70% of people say it's due to sex. Wow. When the relationship is not doing well. But when That's it's doing number. well, yeah, if you ask couples like um, how much of the success of the relationship you put down to your sex life, they say like around maybe between 13 to 17%. So it's not, you know, on top of mind. It's only one of the pillars. I got to tell you, Sarah, we're, you did a great job with the, the speed round. Um, I could talk to you for another four hours. There's so much more that I want to talk to you about. I think we're going to have to have another Deliberate Way episode with you sometime <laughs> soon, maybe when your book comes out. So just a reminder, your book will be coming out at the beginning of this upcoming year. Is that right? Or Hopefully, correctly? yes. If, if everything goes well with the world, another pandemic doesn't hit, everything, <laughs> everything yes. That's, that's right. 
fuel line. Yeah. That's something to look forward to in 2024. Not another heat wave, not another pandemic. Um, Sarah, it has been an absolute pleasure to be able to spend time with you and to cover so many topics. We could only go a few inches deep, but uh, for people who are listening, for other viewers of our content, you can always reach out to Sarah. Sarah, you have a, a really awesome newsletter. I'm signed up for the newsletter now. You've got a very big following on Instagram. You can always follow you also on LinkedIn as well. Um, lots of great stuff coming from you, Sarah. So um, I encourage people, follow Sarah, listen to great advice, not just about love and intimacy, but relationships, common sense stuff that I think will make a big difference. So Sarah, thank thanks again for being on. And Thank uh, you very much. Thank you. Tune in for the next episode where we're going to go deeper into a couple of other areas, not sexology, unfortunately, but some other really intriguing areas. Um, we look forward to seeing you guys. Have a great continuation of your summer. And thanks again, Sarah. We'll see everyone soon. My pleasure.